Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Voice and the host of Inside Personal Growth. And we have a returning guest author uh, coming to us from the Seattle, Washington area. And her name is Carol Sanford. And Carol has, well, she's got a series of books, The Regenerative Life, The Indirect Work. But we're going to be speaking about her newest book called Indirect Work, which I know all of my listeners are going to find fascinating. Good day to you, Carol. We were talking about the weather a minute ago before we got on here, and it sounds like things are great up in the Seattle area. They are, and good morning to you, Greg. I'm glad you're getting sunshine too. We are <laughs> indeed, and I'll let my listeners uh, know something about you, even though we did do the Regenerative Life podcast that we'll put a link to as well. Um, this is another new book of Carol's. Carol is consistently recognized disruptor and contrarian. If you listen to the last podcast, you'll be able to see that side by side with Fortune 500 companies, uh, new economy executives in designing and leading systemic business change and design through her uh, university and in-house educational offerings, global speaking platforms, best-selling multi-award winning books and human development work. Carol works with executive leaders who see the possibility to change the nature of work through developing people, work systems, and ignite motivation everywhere. For four decades, Carol's worked with great leaders of successful businesses such as Google, DuPont, Intel, P&G, Seventh Generation, educating them to develop their people and ensure a continuous stream of innovation and continually deliver extraordinary results. Um, if you want to learn more about Carol, just go to her website. It's Carol Sanford, C-A-R-O-L-S-A-N-F-O-R-D.com. There you can learn about her offerings, her books, her resources. Um, she's got a plethora of information. You can also go out on the internet and see interviews with Carol on YouTube. So Carol, this book um, I found quite interesting because it's really, when you say indirect work, it's the indirect work we got to do on ourselves, um, you know, and if you would tell the listeners about the premise of the book, Indirect Work, and why you believe that the work of inner and outer transformation is the hardest work to engage in so that we can evolve as individuals. I uh, think I would summarize that the reason I wrote this book and what it's about is the ability to create change doesn't come from working at it head on with other people or ourselves. If, for example, uh, we try and do behavior modification ourselves, we mostly call attention to the thing we want to have change. But if we work on the capability to be differently, that's what you're, that inner work, we begin to see the world different and we engage differently. And the second thing that happens then is we affect other people around us because we're different. But <clears throat> what is probably most disturbing to people is that you can't, well, we know we can't change other people, but we don't quit trying. So in our marriages, our partnerships, we're always saying, well, tell people what you think about what they are not necessarily telling them or trying to make them change, but working directly on the subject. So for example, uh, if a child is being rude, our immediate thought is correct them in the moment and say, now we don't want to be rude. Think about how you'd feel if that happened to you. Now that's direct. If uh, it turns out what that does is within our brain and our psyche, it locks in the thing we did wrong. It doesn't necessarily give an image, even though we may tell them what to do. What works better with children, but also with employees, is you engage in developing their capability to discover their own behavior, their own outcomes, and give them capability, like with children. Uh, I run parenting groups also. Uh, you might write a puppet show and have the kids write, be involved in writing the show or writing a story or creating a play. I've actually done this with uh, 11, 12, 13 years old who are trying to figure out how to cope. 
they write a play to help people understand something and it changes them, but it's indirect. It's not head on. Yeah, no, that, let me, yeah. that philosophy, Carol, I think is so appropriate, especially as the, if you're going to evolve the consciousness of the individual, in other words, it gives them the opportunity to use their own critical thinking skills uh, to do that. And I think one of the things that we see, Carol, more missing is really the use of these critical thinking skills yeah. um, in society today. And I, and I, I don't say that it's um, being accelerated by the use of technology, but technology certainly isn't um, helping it any. Um, because we're dependent on Google to go search something or we're doing whatever versus us going and thinking about it ourselves. Now, in your chapel, chapter entitled A New Map, you state that most approaches to change are all working from the old mind. And um, I've heard this terminology by many people that have written books. What we have modified, or it said, what we have modified what we do, but we haven't addressed who we are, which is what you said just a minute ago. What advice would you give the listeners about finding out who they are so that they can make sustainable and meaningful change in their life? Well, here, here I get to be a contrarian. I did, Advice is the opposite of what I'm suggesting in this book. If I'm giving advice, then I have the ideas. You're borrowing my ideas. You're not developing your own thinking. So uh, what uh, I work on is always building capabilities so people select out of their own experience what's going on. So my first piece of advice is don't ever take advice. Don't seek advice. Don't ask other people's opinions. And that, uh, that's been indoctrinated into us for the last hundred years by something called behavioral psychology. And the whole foundation of behaviorism was built on convincing people they can't think for themselves. This is book seven that'll be out in a year. Uh, and if you go look, they, in order for psychology to get a foothold, particularly behavioral psychology, they set out and they put this in writing to convince each human, each parent, each child, each boss or uh, leader in some position that they didn't actually know enough. You needed other people's advice and you needed uh, research based on positive, not your own examination. Real critical thinking skills, as you're talking about, are based on us learning to trust that we can discover if we experience it and reflect. And that's the hard part, learning to be able to observe ourselves in real time we will notice that that's a lie. It's a false premise that we can't do that. And yet every HR program in every company, all the parenting process, all of education is based on external feedback. And I wrote one book called No More Feedback with all that research. Uh, what we have to learn to do is help kids as they grow up and go through school and people who work learn reflection and it's, it's very learnable but it's been taken out of our culture so the real thing we all want to do is take back our own mind not borrow ideas unexamined and not seek for uh, other people how to vote how to look for a job what our career should be think about the number of things where somebody else tells you that and grades you and ranks you that's why I think that's even more an undermining factor than technology. Although I do watch the kids, and I have a lot of 20-somethings in my groups. Uh, they have gotten pretty much addicted to the technology, and they'll tell you it's so easy. Kind of let your mind go blank. And another word for that is passive. So if you're passively taking in things from and a person a media somewhere, you're not working on active capability building and that's the foundation of good critical thinking and a society that works, a democracy that works. 
And I, and I agree with you. And I would say, and I would add to that, that, you know, one of the things that most entrepreneur business owners will speak about is development of their intuition. And I think that intuition is something that, um, and I wrote a whole book on it. Uh, and I did a lot of research for that book. Um, and it's interesting how some people say, well, I'm not intuition. And then I say, how did you come up with the idea? And they'll say, well, I put the dots together. You know, I put this dot, that dot, and that dot together. But ultimately, in the end, there's an action taken on the thoughts that they're thinking. And Carol, this is an, an, ac this is an actionable book. Um, and I want to make sure I get this uh, term right. I'd never heard it before. Intermesmos. Intermezzo. Met, intermezzo, woven into each chapter. And you state that this requires the reader to use intentional, self-observing, then creating of a conscious awareness separate from ongoing mental activities that allows one to objectively observe those activities. If you would speak about those intermesmos yeah. and, and what that's all about, because you have them at the end of each chapter. And I think it's great because it's yeah. very thought provoking. Sure. Um, an intermezzo is an idea that originated in during the enlightenment, whereas music and art and everything were coming, uh, were flourishing and had uh, people supported the artists. And there was the idea of opera and symphony. It, because the opera and the symphony were long, there were breaks, usually two of them, but at least one, that were intermediate between the kind of the inner and outer story. And you know, like where it began and where it ends in the opera or in the symphony, the unfolding of the war and the settling of the war. What those intermezzos were about were to reflect on what was happening to you. We don't use them that way anymore, but if you're listening to an opera, you went out into the foyer or in the aisle and you talked with them and you said, wow, as so I was listening to that crescendo, it's, you know, move into a certain way. I was thinking, it was making me think about, you know, my grandmother and the stories and how I grew, et cetera. So the intermezzo was designed to give you a pause and to reflect on what was happening to you. When I have written um, my previous five books, I noticed that people consume them and I have an unusually high uh, level of people reading the whole book from beginning to end. You know, a lot of people read the first chapter too, but um, I actually, now that sounds great, right? <laughs> but it turns out what it means is they're taking notes, underlining, borrowing my thoughts, absorbing them, quoting me everywhere. And again, you'd think that'd be great. That terrified me. It was the opposite of what I wanted. So I decided as I had almost finished indirect work, I had to slow that process down. I had to convert people to not talking about the story of the opera and the, what Carol wrote, what she said, and how they were going to use it, pull it, these pieces apart, but instead say, huh, I can see how I'm reading. I'm reading it in a way I'm not thinking. I'm not thinking for myself at all. I'm assuming Carol knows it all. And then I give people a set of questions at the end of each chapter, which are uh, inner reflection and noticing that pattern. I had so many people tell me after reading this book, they can never read any of the book in a passive way, in an absorbing way, in a borrowing all the ideas that are unexamined without generating their own thinking. So I thought, aha, the opera intermezzo worked. Uh, however, I still had about 30 people who said, well, I decided to come back and do the intermezzos after I understood everything you were saying. <laughs> you said oh, no, no. I, I wish you hadn't <laughs> yeah I wish you hadn't so yeah. that was the purpose of it and they build a bit right they have right. to go back and look at what are you learning and how's it working so it's a uh I got the idea I think not only from opera which I love the intermezzos 
but from reading Lawrence Durrell, The Alexandria Quartet, when I was 16 years old. It was the third book before I understood, and for anybody who doesn't know the, uh, quad, the four books, it's the same story from four different worldviews. Literally, I mean, it's different voices, but it's like someone who sees the world differently. And you all of a sudden go, oh my gosh, I can now see so many versions of this story. Why have I never done that anywhere else? And as a child, I wanted to uh, go look at everything from different worldviews. So that's where I borrowed, well, and modified my idea. Well, I think, on you. I think the intermezzos is a, is a great opportunity for reflection for people and I would say definitely when you read through this and you look at what she's put at, in there it's kind of grayed you'll see it at the end of each chapter um, definitely go reflect on how you're feeling right. about what you're thinking not about what Carol's thinking or about right. Carol's telling you in the book now Carol you tell a great story about the Chicago Bulls Michael yeah. Jordan and coach Phil Jackson. And you weave this throughout the book, which is really, I thought, mm, kind of unusual, actually, um, because of the number of times that you actually referenced back to it as a way to speak about indirect work. Now, this is truly a great story, and it sets the stage for how indirect work can transform lives and teams, um, which it obviously did for Phil Jackson. Can you tell the story and what happened to the players and the team, because I actually, I read it and I was like, well, I knew Phil Jackson was a great coach, probably one of the best basketball coaches of all times, other than who is the guy at UCLA. Um, he's, he's equally as good. I, I'm trying to think of his name right now. I will. He passed away at 101 years old, actually. Um, but Phil Jackson, obviously has it going on. You know, most people, when they see him from the sidelines, they see a very peaceful right. man who's not, he's not agitated. He's, he's not upset. He's holding a space for his players and he's holding a space for, you know, actually, I even think the audience too, because yeah. when you observe him, it's, it's, he engages everybody. So I'd love you to tell the story because I think it's yeah. a great one. Well, he is, uh, the winning as coach in uh, basketball history. Uh, he has 11 NBA rings. You know, he doesn't, as he says, I don't have enough fingers uh, for all the, uh, we have been, he never says I. Uh, he's, um, he was the coach for most of the players we know names well, Michael Jordan, Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, and that was with, uh, at the, uh, uh, Chicago Bulls and the LA Lakers. Uh, so this is pro ball. You're thinking about college and I can't think who you're talking about either. But what he knew was that most basketball, all basketball was driven toward drilling people so that they uh, shot, became stars. They awarded uh, and gave um, all kinds of bonuses for the number of shots and number of three point shots and uh, competed trying to move people around. So he was a big deal. However, he never told people, he said, don't watch the scoreboard. Watch how well we as a team are being in community and think about that the work we have to do in the world, we will win, that will happen, but it's not our work to win. It's our work to teach young black men in the inner cities that there's a way to play and be in sports that is not cutthroat, that is not trying to compete and win. It's having everybody play. And he he worked with a method that uh, Tex Winter out of the University of Texas uh, figured out, which had to do with making sure there's an equal distribution of scoring and covering across the team, no stars and that you learn to pay in triadic relationships so that you could move more quickly. But he also in the locker room didn't harangue just like you were describing on the sideline. Instead, he would have them sit and breathe together and starting with like, sit and notice your own breath. Now notice 
after a few minutes that you can actually experience the breath of the person next to you. And in a few minutes, we can feel all of us in this room are breathing together. What does that have to do with how we play? And they would reflect on that. So his whole way of working, and he learned a lot of it from Lakota elders, uh, where he grew up and in the uh, boarding house that his parents ran, uh, where many Lakota young men came for work and lived there. Uh, so I give many, certainly not all, of the indirect methods uh, at each point that is relevant. I picked him. Uh, first, I love basketball. I love Phil Jackson. But it allowed me to teach the messages of how much power can happen with a group of people when they don't try and win the game. They try and win life while they're playing with themselves and with one another. And it's an amazing. I had a few people who were furious with me for using uh, Phil Jackson. They said, well, it didn't change basketball. All of, you know, I bet the people who are in the head office never got raises. And I said, well, if Phil Jackson had been in charge, they probably would have. But it was never about money. So that's the Phil Jackson story and why I chose to use it. Well, I think it's um, to use the kind of, I wouldn't say it's cliche ish, but it's kind of like, you know, when people finish those games, those players have almost a out of body experience, right? It's yeah. like it's something greater than the sum of the total. Um, so the experience that they have, and when they would interview those players after a game, you could see that. And it yeah. wasn't just Michael Jackson, it was all the other players as well. And um, I can appreciate you using that story. And I want to thank you for using the story, because I think it was a great way to weave it into the book to really tell what was going on here. And you mentioned that we need a way to rigorous, rigorously examine our thoughts and those of other people. And that is that the role and the frameworks to use to disrupt the models implicit in old ways of thinking. Um, what is that framework? And what are the, you reference them in the book, and I didn't give each one of them, but these levels of worldview, you just mentioned that you had read a book as a, as a young adult that gave four different worldviews, right? And, or perspectives per se, let's put, yeah. look at it that way. Um, what, what are those and that framework, if you could speak about so, it a little bit? So I didn't read a book. These are things I figured out after studying with Thomas Kuhn at Berkeley, who was the uh, author of the structure of the scientific re revolution and the idea of paradigm shifts. It was amazing. I was 20 years old sitting in his class and he kept saying, every uh, few decades, which science changes what it thinks about how the world works. And then we still drag that old worldview with us, that old paradigm and don't let go. And I and a few ask him, well, how do you help people move? How do you know what those are? And he said, that's your job to figure out. I took that charge very seriously, personally. And by the time I was 27, uh, I had learned the idea that frameworks can help you see the world at different levels. So I created something that's in all of my books, which is... Um, were you also, Wade, Carol, pardon me, but were you also, I know, remember reading David Bohm? Yeah. Um, was he one of the people that had some influence on, on you as well? Because I remember studying his work personally myself, because yeah. he's obviously fascinating. He was in England most of his life, wasn't he? Well, he was in the state. I never knew him. He was older than me and had been at Berkeley, I think, 20 something years before me. But his students and he was working on a doctorate. So a few professors who'd worked with him were in the classes. I had to take basic physics and we did. We talked a lot. So those I got to meet Kuhn because he was on campus for a I think uh, 18 months as a scholar or fellow or something. Um, so I, I didn't, I took Bohm's work when I was later and created oh, okay. something out of it. Um, and I'll, well, yes, uh, those people both had huge influence on me and quite yeah. a few other people. Yeah. But you asked for the framework and I think it might be helpful. The worldviews framework starts with 
and extract value. And that means I'm trying to get all I can. So when somebody's in a get advice mode, you tell me or give me your takeaways or what, what am I going to get? Then extract value. The next, and we do that a lot with the earth, with not the earth, with earth, because that's her name. Uh, and we will do that in transactions. The next level of paradigm is arrest disorder. And you can look at the world and even Jackson talks about, we spend so much time trying to stop all the bad stuff. And so that arrest disorder, we can look for the next level up, which even Jackson talked about that he was trying to do good in the world. And I think if he had known there was a fourth paradigm, he would have known that much of what his work was about was not do good because do good can be dangerous. It can be my good, I want you to, I will be good for you and I'll colonize your nation or take your children away and re-educate them. Those are all done in the name of do good. But the last and highest paradigm we can see the world from is living systems, how life works, how, how it comes together. So learning, that's one of hundreds of frameworks and there are no set number, but mine all come through lineage teachings or with, um, you know, they come through famous um, Mahayana Buddhist teachers or Hindu teachers. There are threads through all of those that can give us and help us overcome mental models which are invisible and cause us to see the world in one of those, but partial. So. Yeah. I think what Jackson was working on and what I work on is giving people frameworks or ways to develop frameworks that open their, their mind to other worldviews. I think that's what happened to me as a 20 year old. Well, I, I remember interviewing not that long ago, you know, Ken Wilbur and he has one of his books was like the worldview of everything. Right. And, and it was interesting to, for somebody to actually take the length of time that Wilbur had to try and put all the pieces together, uh, it was it was fascinating. But you know, Carol, yeah, so I need for you to know I don't think he did that. I think that was his intention. But he, what he did is took the work that Sri Aurobindo uh, and the mother had done and translated it. I think poorly into popular yeah, terms. And, and I I would agree with you, but he. He at least made an attempt, and it's like anybody in this world who's either writing a book or trying to get a message across. I think he's trying to reach a certain audience that might uh, that have that appeal. Let's face it; that's kind of what happens. But in, you know, in your chapter, a theory of change, uh, you speak about our own personal transformation from the fundamental Christian beliefs. Uh, to that of embracing science. Now that's a that's a big step. You know, you're you're looking at these fundamental Christian beliefs. Then you state for the next 15 years after arriving at Berkeley that evolution of paradigms within a culture ha was not a linear process. If you would speak with us about the fourfold path of the matrix, the way, implicit or order and indirect work, because that is really kind of at the essence of, you know, where you're, where you're going, at least that's yeah. what I felt. Um, so I would add just a little bit to your interpretation of my life, which is important to the answer to your question, which is, I went from my mental models of Christianity uh, to for a while, what I would call positivist scientists, science, the modern popular science. But I quickly went past it. Yeah, and I'm sure there were steps. I'm sure you just didn't go from Christianity to what it well, is. Well, I, I went past both of those. Mm -hmm. I let go of all of the positivist science and joined indigenous science and lineage science and quantum science. Um, and those are very important. And that's where David Bohm came in. Yeah. David Bohm talked a lot about the kind of science we do nowadays, fragments in things and parts. One of his book, Wholeness and the Implicate Order said, we have to let go of Newtonian science. And um, Einstein has a great story, which I think encapsulates my, uh, my matrix idea and the science that goes with it, which was, 
uh, Einstein has a famous quote saying, don't use the old mind that created the problem to try and find the new one because it won't be any better, right? right. And someone said when he was at Princeton, and one of the professors I had at Berkeley was in classes with him at Princeton and told this story, and I, I published it a few times. He said, well, what do you mean by that, Dr. Einstein? He said, well, I mean that if you are using Newton's idea of physics, you're seeing the world the, through the view of it being a billiard ball table. I think he meant pool because he said there are pockets on it. And you're defining the pockets and you're figuring out who the cue balls are and you think you're the cue stick to hit the balls into the pockets you chose and that people will go there. It doesn't work that way. He said, if you understand quantum science, it's, it says the world is a matrix. And if you think about the matrix, like when a baby is born, it's in a womb, which is the matrix. And that womb is nurtured and but the baby and the fetus chooses what it takes. You don't feed the baby. You don't decide what its arms and legs will look like and its organs and when that will happen. All of that is in the control of the, the being that's growing. When we screw up in society, it's because we think we're acute sick. And because we try and do something to other people, that's the direct way, right? We pick the pockets. We are the cue stick. Instead, we are the nurturers of a womb to make sure the womb is healthy to choose from, for it to grow from. So one of the arenas I talk about is how to build a culture. And I hear people write and talk about culture is a billiard ball game where you get these things to happen, you put these in place and then all that will happen. And your role is as a leader to me, and all that's a definition of trying to take a matrix and make it a billiard ball table. And so Einstein meant, he told his students in his words, you have to let go of the billiard ball view, the pool table view and switch to a matrix view. And that's um, what I was, why I was using I was going to ask you though, but that, let me use this term, maybe it, I think my listeners might relate, that ephemeral element versus a construct on one side. In other words, the construct is the, is the cue and the ball and getting it into the pocket. And we are kind of, I don't, I'm not saying we have to be designed that way, but we kind of are designed that way as human beings to try and find a solution, to try and provide advice, to do. And I'm not saying that this is what we want the listeners out here to take away and say, that's what I am, but they've got to break an old pattern. You said an old mindset. And yeah. that, that mindset is pretty ingrained in a lot of people. I mean, if you, you look, you, you work with CEOs all the time, you've got to restructure this thinking because I would almost guarantee you that 80% of those CEOs are thinking about the billiard ball and, yeah. the, and, the, and the cue stick and right. trying to get it in and reconstruct that way because that's the way they're used to doing it. They're not used to creating a womb and saying, okay, we're going to nurture the womb. That, yeah. that isn't how they think, right? And they don't even create the womb. They nurture one. So first, I do not think we're built that way. I do not think we're designed. I think we're conditioned that way. And that became very popular at the beginning of the 20th century with behaviorism because the whole behaviorism idea was to decide what you want a child to be like or anybody to make our society work where we don't have to have um, uh, bad people in them. And so we were all taught to do what you just said, to advise. We, were ne we lost all the capacity for our sacred schools. They don't exist much except in little hidden places and around the globe. We were lost our capacity for self-observing and self-remembering. And uh, I actually think um, we can rebuild that capability. And when all of my work is by referral, one executive to another, who said this changed my life and it changed my business. If you look at my website, you'll see. Yeah, our, I the, read the referrals. Yeah. Or all the, the introductions in my book. It's not about me. It's that I stumbled on something that 
is really powerful. And if I don't think I'm making them any particular thing, I don't have a template, I don't have a program, I don't have a way you work. I educate so that they they develop the mind and understand that they are learning to look at, regen at patterns. Like even Phil Jackson said, I didn't copy the Lakota, I became a Lakota. I had to really work on seeing the world differently. And once I did, no one had to tell me what to do. I knew my job was a role that was serving the development of the womb. And he uses the term womb also. And I so was he saying, was building the womb of his team. Yeah, and I think I, I totally get what it is. It's like an artist with a canvas. You know, you're providing a canvas and they're able to draw whatever they want on the canvas or to create whatever they want to create. And I think many people don't look at it as a canvas anymore, as a blank canvas. Well, I think I'm teaching them to paint. So they discover what the medium is they want to use. I think we, we all think, see, that would be direct still. The indirect is all I do is build capability, build cultures, and build consciousness. I should not use the word I in any of those sentences. Take them all back. I am working oui. to do the, the capability uh, and the, the work that allow people to do that for themselves. Well, I think maybe a good way to do this would be to talk about the way triad and the three disciplines that describe the way or the goal point on the change framework of uh, capability and culture and consciousness. Also, if you would, reference back to Phil Jackson and how he utilized this change technology, I called it technology, call it yeah. what you will, to transform his team and his players. Because he did do, I mean, you know, we've referenced him once already. I think in the book, you reference him almost in every chapter, but you know, mm -hmm. The reality is you've used this story and weaved it in, and it's a really live, real story about a team and a coach, and it works. So the question is, if you would reference back to Phil and what he utilized the change technology to transform his team and players. So I'll remind people that the way of the techno is a social technology, right, rather than a physical one, uh, was he was always working on making uh, the capability of his team greater, not on particular rope plays running through the uh, motions, and, um, figuring out how you get the most attention. He would do lots of reflection in the um, locker room. And so he would ask them, well, if you think of our audience, and he had three nests. He had all the people who were watching a game, people who ran the game, but always the uh, mostly uh, black kids who were following these players. And he would say, now, if you think of all them as things, what would you think of? And he, people would say, well, tickets to the game and uh, people who will post our picture on social media. If you think of, uh, of them as types, now this was a different level, right, of seeing. All right, what do you think of as you think of our... Uh, our audience is uh, people who go from things to kind of types or some process. And they'd say, well, I guess I begin to see them growing up and um, um, really either becoming winners or losers or something, they become more alive. And he said, well, all right, let's, what happens if you think of the essence of each child or even each audience member? And there would be a lot of quiet, at least the report is, where people just shifted gears. It's like you went from no longer some objective, objectifying view of them as money and uh, some kind of good or bad. You instead really began to think of particular kids who come up to you after the game or in the neighborhood. And you realize that each one of them had a deep essence where they were seeking to bring themselves into the world a more meaningful way. And what they would report uh, after doing those exercises regularly for a couple of years is they couldn't go into a neighborhood anymore and not look at each child. 
not connect with them, not listen. What were they bringing? What were they struggling with? And they went into classrooms and hospitals, not as thinging these people, the kids, you know, and not black and white kids. And I got to help with this one, but more each child has something in my work is to help bring that out. That ch changed how they thought when they were in the arena playing. They realized there were children there who had uh, up until then been more like tickets to them in their previous coaches, tickets to the game, uh, followers on so social media, <clears throat> although they didn't have as much social media then, uh, but followers. That ability to have a kind of capability to see the world and go into a, a different view, a different way of understanding, change who they were. Well, I think and it, it, you know if I'm not life. if I'm not mistaken, you know what's popping up for me intuitively is labeling. Yeah, you know, that's we, categories. We're saying we label somebody as a ticket. We label somebody right. as a you know, a participant or something, instead remove the labels. I think everywhere you go, even in a structure of a corporation, unless it's flat, but you have this hierarchy of labels, you got a president, you got a CEO, you've got right. a COO, you've got a CTO, you've got, and you define, and as you do that, it's not just people coming together, it's certain individuals in there. I mean, would that be a great or would that be a way to kind of look at it is remove these labels? Well, that's the second level. And you okay. remove the second, you do that by going to the third level. We're talking about a framework. Right. So as Bohm says, we categorize everything. And the minute we categorize, we have to have a name for it. Right. So it's right. the thinking that creates the category we have to remove. Not You can't remove the label as long as you've still got uh, the idea that there are categories. And if you don't have the idea that everything has an essence, a third level to our framework. You don't know what, why get rid of categories. You'd say, well, what do I call them, right? You just create another category that was maybe less racist or less hierarchical, like associates. That is still categorizing. Uh, what we want is the framework. That's the key to this book, not an action plan of stop using labels, which I agree we should. But the key is, that's not what Jackson did. He taught people to see, there are actually four levels. I went to three because all we have time for today is to notice, watch ourselves and notice when we're thinking. Notice when we're categorizing and notice the effect of that. That's the important work is noticing and using it to self-observe. And then notice when you step into a real person that has their own unique being. Learning to use that framework is what he worked on. Yeah, I and I and I think you say the essence of the book is that you call it thinging. You've said thinging many times. Um, if, if we <laughs> could, if we could get away from thinging stuff, people, uh, and look at the framework, the larger. You say three levels. There's another level as well. But I think, look, this book is designed for us to question that. It's designed for us to look at the work we have to do within ourselves to actually make this transformation and to open our minds of the readers and for them to see the world order in a transformative way. What takeaways would you like to leave the mm -hmm. listeners with regarding the book and how it can help them personally and professionally transform their thinking and subsequent actions to make this world a better place. Because in the end, this book is about improving ourselves to make the world a better place. So takeaways is direct, right? That's asking for advice and uh, creating what I think is best. And of course, that's the opposite of the book. So let me answer your question, but a different way. That's fine. Uh, okay. Uh, and listen for how often we want direct work. Not not just you. I do it too. It's like we fall into um, what are the key points? What's the advice? What's what can I do to change them? What expert? And I think the most important thing for us to, to do is to notice how passive we are to our own critical thinking, our own 
uh, personal development. We don't observe the effects of how things are happening. Like if you want to do anything with this podcast, instead of if you took notes, throw them away and ask what questions would you, would it be great if you were asking now that you build a long thought on it. And what I mean by long thought is you say, I'm going to start writing about that subject, like learning to observe myself. And I'm going to write a new version of it every day. I'm not going to accept the answer I had yesterday. I'm going to keep working on building a deeper and deeper thought that's my own. That's the most important work we can do and catch ourselves when we think someone is an expert. Uh, I mean, hopefully I've gotten all the word expert and leader out of all my bios. Because the minute we do that, we're creating categories, like you said, labels. And so become mindful. That's the most important thing I think we need as a country, as a people. Well, I, I, your comment about a long thought is really, really, I think, excellent. You know, I did say takeaways because, mm. you know, usually at the end when there's right. a podcast, people are looking to say, okay, how am I summarizing this? Now, what I'm saying is if you removed the summary and all they took away, I'm going to use the word again, was long thought. That, that really today, what I got from Carol was to write about something and then write about it in a different way tomorrow and then the next day and the next day and then you continue to evolve that thought, that what we were talking about, your critical thinking skills. Um, I think that's the best thing that anybody could do. Now, it's not my job to provide advice on somebody else's book. Your job as a listener is to go buy the book, mm -hmm. read it, and create your own thoughts around the book, not mine or Carol's, because that's what Carol is basically saying. Pick up the book, read it, take some time, digest it. Uh, you know, use as she was talking about. Um, let me let me just show the intermezzos. The yeah, the intermezzos. I'm trying to find them. There's the um, intermezzos in each of these chapters. Those right there could be all that you really need. You know, if you did the intermezzos, the time to think and reflect. And Carol, I want to thank you for being back on again, for taking some time with our listeners to explore the indirect work. Um, and I actually like the term indirect work, although I'd say it's, it's just work, period. <laughs> we've got we've got to do the work. And I think you um, you you give people so much to think about. and I think that's the best thing is you you're you're stimulating their thoughts. Um, thank you so much for being on inside personal mm. growth, sharing your wisdom, uh, but at the same time, with that wisdom, giving us the opportunity, to create our own wisdoms yeah. um, and thoughts and ideas. That is the most important part because we all have our own ability to think through our critical uh, things that are happening in our life and what we need to do about them. Um, we don't always need somebody else's advice on how <laughs> to solve something, right? <laughs> yeah. thank, thank you so much, Carol. Have a good day. Thank you. And thanks for being so present. Greatly enjoyed it. Thanks.